Now we will speak a little bit about green open access with a presentation of Afoscience, the EPFL Institutional Repository. Um, the EPFL is about to celebrate the 100,000th publication referenced in, its, in this archive. Um, Afoscience is the result of a strong cooperation between uh, different school departments and services and offers services to the researcher. My colleagues, Pierre Deveau and Alain Borel, both excellent InfoScience librarians, will present what an individual institution can do to promote the wide promulgation of its research results. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> unlike the other presentation, uh, we'll be the two of us to present this one on InfoScience, so we'll share the presentation, so don't be afraid if sometimes the voice is changing. Um, um, this is the first time that I see my presentation on such a screen. This is impressive. Um, <laughs> so, um, InfoScience. We're going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, InfoScience for the next uh, 20 minutes. So, first of all, uh, what we have to say is that InfoScience is to be considered as a green open access tool here at the EPFL. Um, shortly, what we will be saying right now is a first, a very short introduction about InfoScience. The main part will be incentive for scientists. How do we motivate the scientists to put their reference, their publication, their full text in info science? Uh, the results that we've achieved so far, and then the future, uh, what will be info science in five years or more, uh, and then a few questions if you have some. Um, so first of all, I think that many of you have never seen info science before, so we just wanted to show you how it looks like. Uh, this is the main info, info science interface. Uh, to be found on the APFL web, uh, website um, somewhere. <laughs> um, the, goals, uh, the goals of InfoScience, of course, are to facilitate the access of documents produced at EPFL. Might be article, posters, uh, um, all kind of documents um, that you may, might think about. And the sub goals are mainly working tool to create a working tool for EPFL scientists, um, creating also an analysis and decision tool for EPFL faculty. This is becoming more and more um, the case with bibliometry, for example. And then also, of course, to promote EPFL's knowledge and expertise around the world um, through the, those post print and things like that. Briefly going through uh, people behind the project, um, we have eight people uh, in the steering committee, two people in the IT uh, development, and eight uh, liaison librarians. Really important to know uh, that we have the library behind this project. Um, so in total, it's 16 people. They're involved part-time most of the time in, the, in this project. About infrastructure. Uh, once again, quickly going through that. Uh, we have Invenio behind InfoScience, so this is the software that has been developed here at CERN. We have one production server and one test server we can play with for new web services and things like that. And all that is, of course, maintained by the IT uh, team. Uh, a brief history of InfoScience. So it all started in 2004, uh, where the first reference was added to InfoScience. Between 2004 and 2013, uh, we had uh, several developments, uh, some kind of evolution of InfoScience, I would say, that would um, allow scientists to, to uh, better work with InfoScience. The latest evolution was made in 2013, uh, where we developed the My Profiles. It was just last summer. We, we developed the My Profile uh, interface for scientists and, the, and included to the West Citation in the reference of InfoScience. Uh, we're going to talk about all the other one uh, later on, the incentive for scientists that I'm going to start right now. So this is the main part of the presentation. Incentive for scientists, we're going to try to tell how we do here at EPFL to try to motivate the scientists to use InfoScience to try to put their publication uh, open access. So first of all, one thing that is really important, I think this is what we think, uh, we have to go and see them. We have to go and talk with them. Um, to talk about InfoScience, of course, to talk about what it is, how it works, but also to talk about open access, and this is very important. Uh, open access benefit, what is open access, what is a postprint, what is a preprint, and so on. So this is something that takes time, but that is really, really uh, interesting for us and for them. Issues about this, uh, of course, we have uh, many issues. First of all, 
uh, for us here at EPFL is just to, sh to, to clearly identify who's behind InfoScience. So it's not really clear sometimes that the library is behind this. So this is the library that goes to the scientists to talk about InfoScience. So uh, they have to contact mainly the libraries if you wanna, they, they wanna enter the project or so on. Another problem that we have now, of course, you know, you know that APFL is growing uh, more and more these days. So we have a problem here is that how do we manage the multi-site uh, university? I mean, we cannot go to, I'd love to, but Ras al Khaimah. So <laughs> it might be a bit hard uh, for us librarians to go to all those places. And the last one is, of course, to choose the right audience for OA advocacy. I mean, um, when you try to contact a lab and uh, you have only the right to talk to the administrative assistant, of course, it might be a little bit hard to talk about open access because usually the administrative assistant does not really care about open access and will not pass the message uh, further on. Another point um, that we um, like to develop here is the LDISC um, support, of course. Uh, you really have to have a great help this support to answer all the interesting questions that you might receive about info science. Uh, for that, once again, the issues uh, have a flexible help desk software, software uh, because we receive quite a lot of tickets, quite a lot of emails telling us that they have bugs, they don't understand what's happening with their account and so on. So you have to deal with all those tickets, be sure that they are answered and so on. And, and uh, even more important than that, I would say, is that we have to have the general service quality. Really hire great people behind this, so the people that know InfoScience by, by heart, the, ar the archive, the institutional archive by heart, and then can answer the, the question quite, quite uh, rapidly and, and in a really uh, decent manner, I would say. So uh, now we let Alan follow the presentation. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, with, with what uh, Pierre just showed, we are in a good way. We have already established a contact with the scientists, with the authors. So, that's one part of the, of the job. But obviously, we don't have any data yet. So, we want to get their data. We want to get their publications. How do we do that? First of all, when a new lab joins the project, we help them with the initial upload of their existing uh, publications, especially when it's a senior scientist arriving from another university. He will obviously have uh, some earlier publications that he will want to, to advertise, and we will help him with this initial upload that can be significant somewhere. Sometimes, I mean. What does it mean? Yes, no? Ah, okay. Wrong key, sorry. <laughs> so after that, the really, uh, the ball is in their hands. They need to enter their publications as they come out. Uh, this is obviously something that can be a little bit tiresome sometimes, retyping over and over again the same data. So we have built into InfoScience a wizard that can be accessed through just a simple button in the submission interface. And with this wizard, the, well, the, the scientists can search a number of databases, PubMed here, but there's also the Web of Science, Scopus, and try to identify an article that they have just published to get its, uh, its reference. And once it is found and selected, well, the system will retrieve the well-defined and well-organized metadata, fill in all the fields, and uh, so uh, accomplish most of the work on its own. Well, this, uh, this is still a manual operation, and we have also added an automated reference retrieval system for the web of science. So, periodically, the system will check the Web of Science for new publications affiliated with EPFL, retrieve them, try to identify whether they are already in the database, and if not, it will import them and put them in a kind of buffer where they will be waiting for uh, validation by the, the lab we expect to be uh, the author of uh, of the paper. 
This is a kind of thing that also happens when people outside of a lab attribute a publication to a lab that they are not a member of. This is the case, for example, uh, when two or more labs at EPFL collaborate on a project, there will be authors from uh, two, three or more uh, labs, and uh, well, one will go first, usually. And this is uh, how it looks like, well, basically uh, based on the identified authors, the system will propose a number of possible labs that could be uh, to whom the, the reference could be attributed. So the user will just tick one of the boxes or more and uh, move on. And then on the other side, uh, one or several contact persons in the lab will receive an email informing him or her that there are one, two, three or more papers awaiting some, uh, approval and with a link to do that and they will see this kind of interface where they can accept, reject, sometimes delete if it's, if it's not, uh, well, if it's really something that's already there, for example, we don't need two copies of the same paper. And uh, a little bit different interface for uh, submissions by people outside of the lab, there are less options, but the principle remains the same. And of course, well, this is only for indexing and things like that. For open access, we want the full text, and the system also provides some assistance for that. First of all, based on the journal in which the article has been published, the system will query the Sherpa database to provide some information about the journal policy on preprint, postprints, uh, and everything. The, the paper can be, uh, the, the full text, after being uploaded just the usual way, can be described as a publisher version, a preprint, uh, pre a postprint, and the, the author has can uh, define uh, how broadly the, the full text will be distributed worldwide, worldwide with an embryo period, only within EPFL, sometimes only within the lab, and rarely used, but uh, still there, only among the authors of, uh, of the paper. Okay, so uh, not everything is perfect, of course. There are issues here as well. Uh, first of all, the open access mandate at EPFL is fairly young and uh, not very strong yet. Uh, so people don't always feel the pressure to add their full text. Uh, the publisher policies, even within one publisher sometimes, can be difficult to understand. Even with Sherpa, uh, it's still difficult to, for the authors and administrative assistants sometimes to see what they, can, what they may do or not. And there is, on average, really a lack of postprint culture. That means authors feel that the, the only good PDF is the publisher PDF. Everything else is of uh, lesser value, uh, doesn't look professional, and uh, so, uh, yeah, they don't want to put that online. And uh, now for the submission process itself, everything we, we've built has its own issues. Uh, this is in-house development, so everything we build usually takes us one step away from the, the base source code from CERN, and uh, so it can be difficult sometimes to uh, get back together uh, for the next update. Even when we don't have to do that, well, there are bugs to address and everything, so it takes some IT maintenance. And uh, the automated uh, system is not 100% either, so there is always a little bit of backlog that remains, that needs to be uh, processed by hand by liaison librarians, and yeah, that's, uh, that's sometimes a lot of work, because uh, 
If it was easy, well, the computer would have done that already. Back to Pierre. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the next uh, incentives was choice of editorial model. What we wanted to say here is that uh, in order for scientists to feel that they're in control of their InfoScience account, you have to offer a uh, multiple choice editorial model so that they can um, kind of really adapt that thing to their lab, um, uh, their lab uh, workflow, I would say. So what we offer here is that if, if a scientist would like just one person to add a reference in InfoScience, this is possible. If he wants a group of people, it is possible too. It might be all members of this lab, of his lab, or might be uh, a different group of person in EPFL. That, that is always possible. And if the scientist does not trust a lot of, but, uh, a lot of uh, people in his lab, he can always ask for a lab referee, meaning that every time people will, ask, will add something to these count, he will receive an email asking him to validate that, uh, that submission. Um, and the other one, um, it's enhanced visibility. Uh, that is a good one for, for scientists uh, to talk about that with them, uh, they, they like it. So enhanced visibility is that First, to tell them that, of course, we're not expecting people to come to the main interface of InfoScience in uh, EPFL webpage. Um, you have to know that InfoScience is quite well indexed by Google and Google Scholar. So a lot of people landing on InfoScience reference are coming from Google, Google Scholar. Um, we have easy export, so what we understand here is that uh, you enter one reference in InfoScience and then you can reuse that reference, display that reference in other website. Uh, it might be on the lab website, might be on the EPFL directory, might be on the faculty report, for example, because it's easy to extract information from InfoScience. Um, we have also linked references, so uh, we put it here just uh, to say that on each reference you've got several IDs, might be databases ID like PubMed ID or WUS ID, it might also be a, the DOI, of course, and those IDs allows you to bounce to another database in order to search for more information on that author, for example. So that gives more credit to the author. And author identification, so this is something also working with InfoScience, meaning that every EPFL member here do have a skipper number, an ID number, um, and uh, InfoScience add this keeper number to the author that is uh, an APFL member. So um, you can be sure that every uh, author has only one ID. Uh, it is known as ORC ID or the author ID in other databases, so it's working for us too. Uh, this is to show that it's uh, pretty well indexed in Google, so I just made a search of an article here published at EPFL, and you can see that the second and the third uh, result are coming from InfoScience. So this works pretty well uh, when you go to scientists and show them this. Uh, this is to show you that once you have entered a reference in InfoScience, you can retrieve information in another place. So this is, for example, a laboratory website uh, that displays all the references coming from InfoScience. This is uh, the same process, but in the EPFL directory. So you've got uh, the, the professor name, and then he can add the, the publication he wants, the, and those publications are coming from InfoScience. Um, this is to show you the, P, the, the DOI and the ID that you can find on one references. So here you've got the Web of Science ID, the PubMed ID, the DOI. So all those uh, allows you to bounce to another database and, and find more information about the author, for example. And um, the next incentive that we want to talk about is uh, my profile. So this is the latest development of InfoScience. It has been um, uh, put in production in uh, last summer, was in, October, in, in August, I think. Uh, so what is my profile? My profile is an easy way to monitor uh, the impact of a publication that is referenced in InfoScience. So for the scientists, they can easily uh, see the impact of their reference. So what does it contain? Uh, it contains the H indices of Google Scholar and Web of Science. Uh, we plan on adding more uh, of those H indices, like Scopus, for example. Publication year distribution, just to know how many publications they have made in 2012, for example. Number of available publication full tech. This is a very interesting thing for the open access, um, the green open access, given that if you have a thousand reference and only 5% uh, of it that contains an open access uh, full tag, this is not really useful. It's, it's mainly a reference database and not really a green open access um, tool. 
Um, he's got to the number of full text download from InfoScience. That is very, very interesting information for them because they see that the full text they've added to InfoScience is not just lying dead there. It's, it's uh, coming to life. A lot of people download it, and you would be surprised to see the number of downloads that we have. Uh, was citation count, uh, so we import the was citation count in InfoScience like this, they can see straight away uh, how many citations do they have for reference in Web of Science. And journal distribution. Journal distribution is just uh, to let them know in which journal they publish the most. Uh, so to have an idea how it looks like, um, it might be a little bit small, but I think it's, uh, it's easy to, it's possible to read it. So here you've got, for example, the My Profile um, page for Mr. Fillet, which is uh, an assistant professor here at the uh, Life Sciences uh, faculty. So he's got 28 H indices for Google Scholar. He's got 22 for Web of Science. And then if you go down there, you can see the distribution. Uh, so 62 publications in total for this uh, professor. And you can see that uh, in 2012, he published less than 2011, for example. Uh, this is a dynamic um, graph. So if you put the mass on it, it's going to show the number of uh, references. So it's not easy to see it here, but it's easier in life. Uh, you've got the number of full text. So here, for example, he's got only 23% 20, uh, of full text added. So it's only 14 publications out of the, 20, uh, the 23 that we have seen before. So we could do better. Um, and you see that in total for those uh, 40 publication, 14 publication, he's got 9,217 downloads, so which is quite quite a good thing. Uh, just for the first reference, he's got 1,578 um, downloads. Citations, like I said, citation coming from us. Once again, we could uh, think about adding citation from another uh, database, like Scopus, for example, like PubMed, uh, Europe PubMed Central. Uh, those kind of things might be possible. Um, so here, for example, the first citation has been uh, cited 21 times. So this is information coming from Web Science only. And journals, the last point, just to show you that here Mr. Fillet is mainly publishing gastroenterology, gastroenterology, journal of infection disease, and so on. So this is just a, a short, a, a very brief view of uh, uh, which journal he publishes. And then I will let Alan finish. Okay, so after all that, well, how are we doing with respect to our goals? I mean, repeating, so a working tool for EPFL scientists, analysis and decision, promoting EPFL's knowledge. Okay, first of all, we have over 100,000 references, about 101,000 now. So that's pretty good, I think. Uh, the full text get downloaded quite a lot, so apparently, it's not so bad. We have actually over 400 labs registered in the system. For those who uh, remember and pay attention to the numbers, it's more than uh, Professor de Vaupledon so, uh, said uh, this morning. Uh, actually, it's very difficult to get a definition of what a laboratory is at EPFL, so uh, we just use different definitions. But that means almost all of them. Now, for the full text, I mean, it's not so great. It's okay, but uh, we could do definitely much better. There's about only about one third of the references that have a full text, and only one quarter of the references are actually in open access. So, uh, yes, this is really far from, uh, from perfect. Okay, well, yeah, but... 5,000 to 6,000 publications added every year. Okay, that's good. So uh, what can we do? And uh, where do we want to be in five years? Well, we look okay, so we think the future is bright, but we have room for improvement. Uh, for example, perhaps the open access mandate will become stronger in the, in the coming years, so that would uh, obviously have an impact on us. We want more full text, we really, really, really do. Uh, user services will have to change, to evolve. Uh, for example, well, there's not much Web 2.0 functionality in the current uh, system. Uh, perhaps we'll have to do that to offer better service. Perhaps online tutorials will become the norm 
if we can't uh, travel to uh, the uh, Arabic uh, Emirates every day. We don't offer much for research data management right now. We probably will not host research data on the system, but we will have to uh, become part of the network that, contain, that contains it. Bibliometry, what will we do? Will we include ad metrics, uh, perhaps use InfoScience as a dashboard where citation counts coming from different databases can be uh, checked out and, uh, and compared because uh, it's always a different number. And uh, the IT infrastructure will certainly have to evolve as well. We only have two servers right now, that's not much. Uh, data storage is uh, a little bit of a concern. We don't have so much space left, we can increase that, but uh, by how much and uh, how do we ensure long-term preservation, that's not an answer that uh, we can, uh, that's a question that's still not answered. And there are also all kinds of other evolutions that, uh, that could happen there. Okay, and uh, that's about it. So if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Um, If I understood well this morning, uh, listening to Mrs. Meyer, we have to develop the interfaces with uh, big uh, thematic archives or international archives, because that's a weak point. And if you're in Afosciences, we don't have easy uh, export or imports with uh, archive and so and repositories. Let's that. So we have to improve that. Um, are there questions? <laughs> so, I didn't actually know that uh, the EPFL was building this. That's pretty cool. <laughs> it's quite a big project. I'm really impressed. Um, is this just for the EPF, EPFL researchers, or is this a service that's going to expand? Um, no, the, this is really designed for for EPFL. There are a couple of uh, interinstitutional programs that have been accepted into the system, but uh, it's really not meant to to expand much farther. We we certainly don't have the the infrastructure to uh, to accept uh, publications from the general uh, scientific world. Although that would be fun, obviously, but uh, <laughs> and service would be an issue as well. These microphones are too complicated. Um, I have a pretty specific question. I hope I'm not being too specific. Um, some publishers, and I'm thinking in particular of one very big publisher and might actually be the only one, um, has a policy of uh, imposing conditions as to what articles can be posted on institutional repositories, etc. pp. Um, and you said the future is green, but then at the same time you said there will be more mandates, stronger mandates by funders. Um, specifically what I'm referring to is that one very big publisher says if you, have, if you are actually mandated to practice open access by your funder or by your institution, uh, you can only post your um, articles in an institutional repository if there is a specific agreement between the institution and the publisher. So I would be interested to hear from you whether you have any experience on that and how are you dealing with that? Well, I'm not sure, but perhaps. <laughs> Actually, I, I know of a publisher, a significant publisher, at least in its field, that has a policy a little bit like that, so perhaps it's the same. And uh, well, as it happens, I have published uh, a paper in a journal from that publisher this year. 
and I read the, uh, the licensing agreement. And okay, basically what it said was that check, you should check with your editor. So I checked with the editor and uh, the editor has, had absolutely no idea <laughs> of what was involved and whether it was okay or not. Uh, so eventually, uh, I said, okay, EPFL has signed the, the Berlin Declaration, so uh, that is my mandate. And uh, the editor said, okay. So uh, I added the, the preprint that can be distributed right away and the postprint with, uh, with an embargo period of one year. And uh, well, I, I have a written uh, agreement by them, so. I think that's okay, but it's a lot of work to to actually uh, follow these uh, these rules. And uh, well, I was glad to have the opportunity to do it because I'm really afraid that uh, many scientists will not want to to go through through all these hoops. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say too that uh, we are not responsible uh, in for science for what's in the database. We are really, really clear at the beginning when we go to see the scientists that we offer the platform, but every time they put something in, if they are not allowed to put it, it's their responsibility. So I know scientists, for example, that are really revolutionary, for example, and they put every full text. They don't really care about Sherpa, was telling Sherpa, and so on. So uh, that's fine. We love those kind of scientists, but most of the time uh, we are not responsible for that. So they have to look for this. But I have no uh, experience of a scientist having uh, received an email telling you should not do that. Please, uh, this uh, myself. I know that Alan has, but uh, on my side in life sciences, I had no idea of this. Okay. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, do you intend to uh, invite? The We have no clear plans for that right now. Uh, I suppose we took a very small step in that direction with, uh, with my profile. I mean, people are invited to enter their, uh, their Google Scholar ID, uh, their WAS ID. We could, well, we could certainly add ORC ID to that, and, but then we would have to figure out how to present it to researchers and, uh, so that they can understand what's in it for them. I think it must be said that we will do that if we see an advantage of doing it, of course. So uh, if that can allow us, for example, to save a lot of time for the uh, import, that would be a great thing. And if that is an advantage for scientists, it would be a good thing too. But so far, it's really not really clear. The situation is not really clear, so we wait. Okay. 